you get visual loss, you ask the question, is it monocular or is it bilateral? Is it one side or both sides? Tonight, this afternoon, we're going to talk about unilateral visual loss. Um, and so unilateral visual loss can be painful or painless. And the painful causes uh, temporal arteritis, the neuritis that you get, all those things on the right. The glaucoma is the big one you don't want to miss. Just, just going back, bilateral visual loss is probably going to be something that's, uh, I mean, you can have a bi bilateral temporal artery, I suppose, if, if you've got, um, if you're predisposed to these sort of vasculitic diseases, you'd be a bit unlucky. Toxic causes, methanol, etc. The old days, we used to get people that come in and go blind. Not going to, we don't see that uh, much now. We don't see it now. Or you can have bilateral occipital infarct, which would also be a little bit unlucky, I suppose. But we'll just talk about unilateral. And the other thing is painless unilateral visual loss. You've got to think about vascular type lesions uh, that are that are where you've got a thrombus, uh, so central retinal artery, central retinal vein occlusions. Uh, and then you've got to think about other things such as retinal detachment. So painless, unilateral, visual loss. So what we see in this particular picture is this, this red spot here, which is actually the fovea. And it's, it's kind of, you'd call it cherry red, wouldn't you? It's so nice and bright. So a fairly classic cherry red um, uh, cherry red spot with a pale optic disc, which is central retinal artery occlusion on fundoscopy. Now, who gets these sorts of views? When you look at a fundus, do you get these sorts of views? Have you seen those new uh, fundoscopes? They're pretty good. Okay, you get very good views. But you don't necessarily have to get a full artery occlusion. You can actually get a retinal artery branch occlusion which may not present with a full cherry red spot. So you can get deviations, but you've just got to keep thinking that it may be that. Uh, the causes tend to be thrombotic or embolic causes, uh, and clinically they'll get decreased visual acuity fairly quickly, um, and they'll get an afferent pupillary defect. So the Marcus Gunn pupil, the afferent pupillary defect, we'll mention it in a second, and on fundoscopy they'll have a pale disc and a cherry red spot. So this is the relative afferent pupillary defect they're trying to show us. Let's see. So what happens normally, is that, so that's, that's accommodation there and a bit of constriction. Let's see what they're doing. I can't remember this video. So if you turn the lights down, they dilate up a little bit. And what tends to happen when you shine a light in a normal eye is it constricts and then relaxes just a little, okay? So if you shine it, there's a direct response and a consensual. Okay? And this is when you're doing the Marcus gun going back and forth. In a normal eye, <clears throat> you'll get both constricting because you've got cranial nerve 2 and cranial nerve 3 coming back, both working. Well, what happens is, if in one case you, this doesn't work and it's an afferent pupillary defect, you will shine the light and it'll look like everything is dilating. Okay? So what's happening is, let's skip that and go to the next slide. I walk around with one of these books. I walk around with these books, and every time I read something that I kind of enjoy, I usually I usually do a sketch or I draw it or I can, and there's, there's you know there's twenty or thirty of these sitting around in the study, and usually I forget in which one I've drawn something. But it's kind of cool when you go back and you look at them uh, a few months later. Uh, so let's say we've got um, let's say we've got a lesion. Let me show you on one of these sites. You've got a lesion that's going on here on this side, and you shine the light, what's going to happen is you're not going to get any input going back into the brain. And so if you're not getting any input, if you shine the light on this side going back into the brain, you're not going to get cranial nerve 3 giving you a direct response back for constriction and a consensual. Okay? So that's where the lesion's going to be. 
if there's no lesion here and you, and, you, and you shine the light in this eye, you're going to get optic nerve two sending a, a signal to the brain and the third cranial nerve will come back and make you constrict on this side and make you constrict on the other side. But what will happen is as you're going back and forth with the Marcus gun pupil or the afferent pupillary defect, as you shine this back and forth, you will see that both pupils will dilate. Okay, and then you've just got to stop it and do it again slowly on either eye and you'll be able to work out which one has got the afferent pupillary defect. Uh, the management. Has anybody ever had a central retinal artery occlusion? Put your hand up. Yeah? Yeah? Anybody else? Yep. Okay. I mean, there's not a lot you can do for these patients, really. I mean, there's a, there's a bit. But what the whole idea for us when we're looking at it is we think initially what we've got to do is we've got to move that thrombus into a branch. So we, one of the things is digital pressure. And the way to do digital pressure is you put some gentle pressure on the eye for a few seconds and then you release it. Sort of push and then release it. And then push, hold it on there for five to ten seconds and then release it. The whole idea is to push it into a branch artery. Um, and we, we think about diamoxetazolamide. Um, and um, we, want to, we want to decrease humor production, so a beta blocker is always a good idea, and we'll consider mannitol in these cases. And the ophthalmology people come in, and one of the things that they might want to do is do uh, some anterior chamber paracentesis and decrease pressure. Now, I don't have one from a central retinal artery occlusion, but let's see, we've got one here that's for a, a high femur in the eye, as you can see. And so this is a high femur, and for some, this has been uh, raising pressure significantly, and so they, they can see the high femur, they've decided they want to drain it. So, so this is the same sort of paracentesis they're going to do for this, is the sort of paracentesis that you would do. And this is a great ophthalmology um, uh, reference. So you just go in laterally with a steady hand, There's no trembling at all in that scalpel. Look at that. <laughs> and he's out. And, f and then you dilate it up. Don't blink. Dilate it up. And all you need to dilate is just put a little bit of pressure to open it up and it starts to flow. And you can actually see, you can actually see it when it's got contrast in it. That's flowing out. There we go. That's the humour. Yeah? So that's what might have to be done, but you're in a world of hurt when this happens, and in many cases, you're not going to be able to do too much for these patients. So, what's the diagnosis here? The blood and thunder fundus, the tomato sauce fundus. Well, what is it? This is central retinal vein fundoscopy or central retinal vein occlusion. Now, this is painless loss of vision. Uh, it'll come on in minutes. It won't, it won't come on as suddenly as central retinal artery. And the causes can include glaucoma or hypertension or diabetes. All those things are in your, in your handout. How about painful causes? What about this? Anybody give me a diagnosis of this? You've got significant disc edema here. And this is an optic neuritis that occurs. So the vision declines over days in optic neuritis. Uh, and interestingly, colour vision is affected in these patients. And the thing about optic neuritis is that it's closely related with a demyelinating disease. And so in this patient group, you'll find that about a quarter of the patients um, with MS present with this, and in about three quarters of the patients that end up getting MS, they've had this as a presenting complaint. So it's something you've got to think about when they do present. And they have decreased visual acuity, they've got an afferent pupillary defect, they've got decreased colour perception. And there's a difference between it being uh, neuritis that's proximal to the disc and, and where you might have a normal fundus, and so you might have neuritis going backwards through the optic nerve and you'll do this MRI scans that'll allow you to work that out. So it can be optic or retrobulbar, and the retrobulbar won't have the necessary disc blanching and edema. 
but a painful eye, decreased colour perception, vision decreases, afferent pupillary defect. And people that have anything wrong with their optic nerve will have an afferent pupillary defect. So think about it that way. Um, no, I won't do that one. Temple arteritis, we mentioned it before during headaches, visual loss, they'll get pain over the temple artery, it'd be, it'd be tortuous, they might get some jaw claudication, and they'll have decreased visual acuity, and you know, once you're getting down that road, you, you might have missed the boat a little bit, but they need biopsies and the ESR be right, you get 100 milligrams a day for whatever, seven, 10 days, whatever, two weeks, and they get better, maybe. So the take home is painless loss of vision when it's complete, You've got to start thinking of central retinal artery occlusion. When it's not complete and you're starting to see, um, and, and it happens over a slower period of time, you've got to start thinking of vein occlusion. When they've got vein occlusion, there's really very little you can offer them. There's very little that you can really offer that's going to make any difference. And remember the afferent pupillary defect to check that bouncing Marcus Gunn pupil. Because if you get that, it actually means that something quite significant is occurring. That leads us very nicely into the next talk, which is the red eye. This is really important. Now, I've got about 15 types of red eyes to show you. You know, I, we're talking about there's only two I'm interested in. In fact, I'm interested in less than two. I'm only really interested in one. You know, when somebody says to me, you know, I've got a spider bite, and I say, well, how many spiders am I interested in? A funnel web or a red back. Okay, not interested in any others. All right. What about the um, what about the uh, what's it, the what's the huntsman? I've been bitten by a huntsman. It's a little bit painful, but it's not a big deal. What's the one that everybody thinks causes necrotizing fasciitis? The white tail, the much maligned little white tail spider that came out of one case in France and they found tuberculous stuff going on in the wound. A little spider doesn't do anything. Play with it, let it crawl all over your fingers. There's nothing wrong with it. Maybe. <laughs> okay, the anatomy of the eye.